When the continents were closer together, the world was green. For millions of years, land masses were shades of jade, emerald, and pine. Until one day, one of these plants bloomed. A mutation, a freak of nature, a plant that was supposed to make a leaf, accidentally created a petal. And the trend took off. Over the next hundred million years, one by one, flowers started to pop out of the thick green landscape. A time lapse looks like someone is turning up the saturation filter on Earth's forests. The color spectrum is just being born. It looks like a massive rainbow fell from the sky cracked onto the ground, and no one cleaned it up. Flowers became a permanent fixture on our planet, just in time for dinosaurs to trample on them. And the original mother, the Eve of Flowers, supposedly resembles the modern magnolia blossom. It's believed that this flowering tree was the first of its kind, and it made its way along the supercontinent. The magnolia tree is so old, it predates bees. Instead, the plant seduces beetles into their bosom blossom. But things fall apart. Relationships change and plate tectonics move each new continent took a magnolia with them, like dividing up a silverware set between parting roommates. Since then, the magnolia tree has evolved with each separate landmass and adapting to its new surroundings. Some are short and shrub-like, while others reach 80 feet tall. The flowers can be anything from pink to ivory or lavender. Some petals are thin like fingers, others are as thick as hands. Today, on our seven separate continents, the magnolia tree is one of the oldest remaining species of the land before time. And in 1889, there is one woman who is so grateful to see the varieties of the magnolia. As she stands under one of these magnolia trees, thousands of miles from her home, it still reminds her of the ones she used to sit under as a child and write poetry. And she's so grateful she gets to see the varieties of the magnolia and all that her planet has to offer. I'm Adrian Bain, and this is Strangers Abroad, a race around the world, based on the true story of Elizabeth Bisland. On the days that Nelly is in Penang and Singapore, Liz is also ready to take a breath from her ocean voyages. She sails along the East China Sea from Hong Kong to Singapore. In these days, Liz doesn't have the daydreamy ride the way Nelly does. For the five days, she travels the South China Sea from Yokohama to Hong Kong the ocean rages. She comes in the night and beats thunderously with her great fists upon our doors. She roars with wrath and will not be appeased. Back to counting the slats above her bed again. I find now that bodily I am proof against seasickness, but my temper has a violent attack of mal de mer. It makes me bitterly cross to go leaping and plunging about the ship, not being able to keep my seat and to gradually 
collect my soup and entrees in my lap. After days of being tossed about, the waters eventually calm and turn into a sparkling green emerald as they sail to the doorway to China. Day 32, December 15th. On the fifth day at sea, Hong Kong comes into view. Hong Kong! I like the name of my next port. It has a fine, calamorous significance, like two slow, loud notes of some great, brazen lunged bell. Hong Kong! Liz takes another exhale of relief. That land is near. We decry again on the horizon the bamboo wings of the fishing and coasting junks. These sails are somewhat larger and deeper in hue than those of Japan, and still more resemble the fans of giant yellow and russet butterflies. Liz is 31 days out from New York and finally in China the other side of the planet. Liz's ship slips into the Pearl River Delta and the Amethyst Island grows in more detail. This island city is surrounded by violet mountains dotted in evergreens that cut off right at the busy water's edge. It is one of the most beautiful harbors in the world, the water winding deeply inland between the hills, flowing around island mountains ringed with girdles of foam. All around the harbor are tall, thin islands sticking out of the water like thumbs. Swaying around them are massive cargo steamers and large European military ships owned by the Russians, French, and British. Hong Kong is only 10 square miles large, but this patch of land floating off of China has as much economic significance as the country at large. The island of Hong Kong is a cluster of lofty, abrupt hills with scanty vegetation seized by England in 1842 after a struggle with China, which is a grand oversimplification. But it is why there are so many British warships idling in the harbor. The English have elevated the village into a flourishing city and made it the fourth shipping port of the world. Liz takes in the salty air and it's here that Liz will not be a total stranger. Because by beautiful coincidence, she has friends here, a lovely German couple. Her endless socializing paid off. Her German friends send their private steam launch to her on her boat. And when she gets in their little boat, she analyzes the local fishing women's attire. She admires how sensible it is. The Chinese women of the working class decided centuries ago on the divided skirt. She cloths herself in a pair of wide black trousers, a loose tunic, jade earrings, and cork sole shoes and is ready for all the emergencies of life. When Liz docks, one of her German friends is waiting for her in her personal sedan chair. Liz falls into her friend's arms and gives her a huge hug as the crowd of travelers move around them. This is the kind of welcome she wishes she could have had at every port. And after a month of traveling, Liz is so happy to see a familiar face. She feels her cells relax. They take a step back and look at how their faces have slightly aged since the last time they saw each other. 
Then, Liz looks at these new modes of transportation. Sedan chairs are totally different from the rickshaws in Japan. Liz's friend sits in her personal upholstered armchair, trimmed with silver, with two long bamboo poles threaded through the bottom. There are no wheels. The bamboo poles rest on the shoulders of two, sometimes four men, in loose black pants and white cotton tunics. Liz hesitantly hops up on her sedan chair, and her and her friend weave through the narrow old neighborhoods made of native stone. Liz looks up at all of these different kinds of sedan chairs, all bobbing around looking like a movable feast, which the upper class can afford. Liz feels a little weird being carried around by four people, but she does appreciate the distance from the overwhelming smells of opium, dried fish, and joss sticks. And she has a quick flashback to being in the theater in San Francisco's Chinatown. She sways from side to side and gazes down as people move around her. Liz loves the tropical appeal of the city. The verdure is magnificent. The town is submerged in it and flowers are everywhere. Heliotrope Bougainvillea tumbles over walls that line the long and massive staircases around the city. Orchids overrun the sidewalks like weeds. Liz overhears so many different languages down below. She gazes at the wide range of different faces moving around her. Old, wrinkled Chinese women walking around in their silk gowns with their hands tucked away in loose sleeves. She tilts her head up and sees Macanese locals, people of Chinese and Portuguese descent, peering down from their balconies in front of their bamboo blinds. Then Liz takes a long gaze as a Parsi from one of the lost tribes passes her by and is swallowed up by the crowd. And out of all of the chaos, one man stands out to her. A tall, gorgeous, dramatically dressed gentleman catches her eye. At the corner stands a haughty, jeweled-eyed prince of immense stature, straight and lithe as a palm, whose high features Bronze contents are unfathomable of pride and passion. He wears a soldier's dress and a sword and a huge scarlet turban of the most intricate convolution. I cried out with astonishment at the sight of the superb creature. Is that an emperor? I demanded in breathless admiration. Why, he's only a Sikh policeman, my friend said. There are hundreds about this place, quite as superb as he. Liz's eyes are filled with hearts. She feels a heat swell in her body. She stares at his broad chest, strong legs, red turban, and the long sword at his hip. She raises an eyebrow bites her lower lip, and thinks, if these were the police officers, what do the princes look like? Her head swivels and stays locked on this handsome police officer as her sedan chair pulls her farther away from him. Liz makes a quick stop at the Great Northern Telegraph Company to tell Cosmo that she arrived in Hong Kong. She then hops back onto her sedan chair and begins the long ascent to her friend's home. Her friend's home is snug on a jungly hill overlooking the city, and these poor drivers had to slug all of Liz's luggage and her body up these massive hills. 
Across the street from her friend's house is a light blue all-girls school run by the Portuguese. Here, young Chinese girls are taught the sweet decency of life and pretty feminine arts. By now, Hong Kong is its own separate entity from China. It goes under its own economy and own rules. But I can't imagine that the customs and ideas around Chinese women changed overnight. Historically, women in ancient China did not have any kind of social status. Females are subjected to the three followings. First, you follow your father, then your husband, then your son. And you better have a son or else no one is going to take care of you. A woman's role is to serve whichever male relative is in charge of her well-being at the time. And if a family doesn't have sons, it's the wife's fault. Even though sperm determines sex, the wife is seen as broken. And although Liz cannot vote in her country and has limited rights, at least she is not socially tied to her father or is pressured to have a son until she dies. Liz turns her head away from the all-girls school and looks at her friend's home. Liz turns into the driveway of her friend's apartment and makes herself at home. Her friend has impeccable taste. Rooms are heavily draped in dark velvets and marble furniture. Photos of the Prussian royal family adorn every room. Liz is escorted into a huge bedroom with her own private stone bathroom. Honestly, it's probably bigger than her Manhattan apartment. And just outside her window is the view of the city. As the sun disappears, Liz steps outside to take the whole scene in. The moonlight drapes the white city into a midnight blue. She sees people moving about at a distance. Little lights twinkle as the night begins to fall. She stares out at the small island mountains surrounded by boats in the harbor. She's starting to get the hang of all of this international travel. Day 33, December 16th. Liz wakes up excited to explore Hong Kong. She loves that she has a few days to sink her teeth into the city. Well, at least the Western version of Hong Kong. Many of the British ports are bifurcated between local areas and where the Europeans take root. So first, Liz and her friends take their sedan chairs down to the local area where Liz quickly discovers that any Chinatown she explores back in America will always be a watered-down version of the original. As they make their way down the hills, it is much hotter down here on sea level. And it's thick with pungent smells of metropolitan life. Because Hong Kong is unbelievably dense, it's estimated that 1,600 people live in a single acre. The town is growing and prosperous. The shops, hotels, clubs, and counting houses are handsome stone buildings surrounded with deep arcade-like verandas. There are large shipyards and vessels afloat. The export trade in cotton, tea, silk, spices, and rice is enormous and the place develops year by year. They pass butcher shops with ducks hanging from their necks. The smells of soy sauce, fish balls, and tea eggs perfume the open air markets. Sidewalks are also dining areas where men sit at long tables on small benches and dig into bowls with their chopsticks. Long, vertical signs hang above their heads covered in Chinese characters. 
The streets are more chaotic here than the calm, quiet ones of Japan. Liz rides high above the chaos and has a balcony seat to the goings on of daily life. Liz is enraptured until the Scottish regiments walk by. The strategic importance of Hong Kong is so great that four or five warships are always in its harbor or cruising into the neighborhood, and two full regiments are kept in garrison. Scottish regiments wearing white jackets and helmets with their kilts in this heat, they are being put through a rapid and vigorous drill. Liz stares as they do military exercises and work up a sweat in their army uniforms. One morning, when we pass the parade ground and pipes are shrilling, scurrying music to stir the heart in which runs in the smallest drop of Scottish blood, not even the Sikh policemen stand first in my affections at this moment. Oh, bronze sight, oh, bony lads, Scotland forever. The heat is getting to her. So Liz tries to emotionally cool off by focusing on the foliage. At this season is of Eden, heirs of paradise wave through the splendid tropical foliage. My friends are loathed that I should lose a single pleasure and we are out all day in this adorable weather. One of the paths lie through the green twilight of the botanical gardens, filled with such vegetation as I have always regarded with a doubting eye. We pass under tremendous lacy shadows of ferns, twenty feet high through trellises, weighed with ponderous vines, that blow a myriad of perfumed purple trumpets up to the golden noon and emerge on sunny spaces where fountains are sprinkling silver rain upon banks of crimson and orange flowers. Here in Hong Kong, Liz is enamored with all of the trees, plants, and flowers sizes and shapes she could have never imagined. They end their day of exploration with another view of the city. They trek up to a popular peak, 2,000 feet above sea level. They all get into a little tram that pulls itself up on the side of a mountain at a 45 degree angle chugging up along like the little engine that could. The higher they get, the wider her views become of the city. They pass resorts and beautiful Italian-styled bungalows. Liz feels the cool wind on her face as they pass a thousand feet above sea level and then two. Once they get to the top, the first thing Liz sees is construction of a summer hotel. But she does find a spot to look at the scenic view. We can see from here how the water flows between the hills and how the barber broadens to bays and narrows to straits between the island mountains. Only at Rio Janeiro and Sydney, they tell me is there a harbor whose beauty compares to this. Liz takes it all in, the vibrancy of the Eastern world. As Liz stands overlooking the city and the oceans and islands around it, with mainland China just to the north, Liz feels as big as the mountain itself. She is really on top of the world and can take anything on. She is so far from home and farther than any of her dreams 
could have ever taken her. The bird is no longer caged. She dials into the energy of the universe. As her and her friends turn around and make the long way down the mountain, something shifts within Liz. Fueled by endorphins and adrenaline, she enters a trance. During the first stage, we are in full sunlight, passing under the walls of the white palace-like bungalows. Then the road here is a thousand beautiful shades of buff and rose, and we pass into the shadows. On their way down, she passes a tiny Greek church, and behind the church is a sparsely populated graveyard. The sound of the ocean below her strengthens her meditative state. She stops, and stares at it and gets lost in a daze. A great pure calm rings where we sink into this cool flood of darkness. I know all of this. I remember it well somewhere. Once I passed through such shadowy ways in the warm nights, the silent peace of darkness after long hours of burning light is quite familiar to me. I tried to recall where it was, but it was a long, long, long time ago, and I have forgotten the name of the place and the people who lived there. I only remember that I used to pass under the great trees that some wonderful, secret delight waited for me beyond them. Alas, that was very long ago. Maybe she's feeling a moment of deja vu, or a whisper of a past life. Her senses expand as she gets in harmony with the frequency of the universe. Day 34 December 17th. On her third night in Hong Kong, Liz gets to experience the real rich side of Hong Kong. Her friends introduce her to a man who is a walking metaphor of Hong Kong itself, Cat Chick Carter, a man of many names and businesses. He's a British subject, a resident of China, born in India with a mix of Greek and Armenian blood through his veins. He's lived in Hong Kong for 20 years and made a fortune in a little bit of everything, from shipyards to manufacturing. Mr. Carter joins Liz's friends at their home one day for Tiffin. Liz can tell he is one of the beating hearts that keeps Hong Kong thriving. And when Mr. Carter takes one look at Liz, he says he would like to take her to the Pleasure Dome. Now, unfortunately, this is not a euphemism. It's an actual building he's trying to create. And it may sound like a Victorian orgy house, but it's actually just a glorified dining hall. Mr. Carter is remaking the Pleasure Dome that Genghis Khan built. It's where he would hang out as the Lord of Asia as his empire roared through the rest of the continent. And Mr. Carter says he would love nothing more than to bring her there. An adventure is afoot. In the afternoon of Liz's final day in Hong Kong, she and her friends find themselves in the womb of the Pleasure Dome. A lordy pavilion set on the crest of many flowering terraces, surrounded by the view of the sea and leafed tropical foliage. The center of the pavilion is a great banquet hall with a domed roof 30 feet out above the tessellated pavement. 
The walls are frescoed in the same deep cream color. The exterior touched here and there with rose blue and gold. It was surrounded by roses and had windows to the green waters of the harbor. At each end of the banquet hall opened a drawing room set with mirrors. Here guests come by in twenties and fifties and feast splendidly on high days and holidays and on hot star light tropical nights. It's like the sumptuous fancy of a splendid Roman noble. The place was sadly still under construction, so they go back to Mr. Carter's place and ate through many courses and drank many costly wines. Liz wishes she could have stayed long enough to enjoy the space once it's built, and for a moment she curses the race. Why must I rush? I just got here. All oh, what I wouldn't give for more time. But this is a rule of travel. You will always meet the best people and go to the coolest places the day before you leave. And eventually, Liz's short visit to Hong Kong is up. But Liz feels a shift in herself. Liz loves becoming more interesting and collecting the little stories from around the world. She feels like the best version of herself. Day 35, December 18th. While Liz has been taking it easy in the Pleasure Dome, JBW has been looking for ways to speed Liz along. On the morning of December 18th, Liz will be getting on the large and luxurious steamship, the Prussian, which will take her all the way to Genoa, Italy. However, JBW had been working hard to convince the owners of the Prussian to surpass its fastest time. He offered them a, quote, substantial reward. And now, with the right incentives, the owners of the Prussian steamship predicted that they could get to Genoa five days ahead of schedule. This sets Liz up to be back in New York by January 26, ending the race in 73 days. All of this is set in motion the morning of the 18th. The bribes are offered, bags are packed as the Prussian is being inspected. Liz is sad to leave her friends, knowing she won't see any familiar faces for another 40 days. But she loves that here, halfway around the world, she is still her best self when she is exploring another culture, another city, and meeting incredible new people. Everyone she met came to see her off, surrounded by the charming friends and acquaintances of this Hong Kong episode, who had come to give me a final proof of their goodness and wish me speed on my journey. But Liz doesn't get to step onto her steamship because a problem is found. Someone found that a blade propeller has lost a screw. Now this is a common yet annoying accident. This one small piece of metal renders the ship and all of its passengers stranded. The ship has to be towed into the port and fixed on land, which could take who knows how long? So when word hits Elizabeth's ears, she doesn't wallow, curse the fates, or look at it as a sign to stay in Hong Kong. She hustles with all of her bags and trunks to the local P&O offices, the same company that got her across the Pacific. Panting, Liz explains her predicament. I need to get on a boat to Singapore immediately and I need to be back in New York in 41 days. 
At the desk, the officer suggests the Thames, a British mail boat, on the P&O line, which is leaving that afternoon for Colombo Salon. It isn't as luxurious as the Prussian would have been, but Liz has a job to do. With her ticket to the Thames in one hand, she writes a telegraph to Cosmo in the other. Within minutes, she finds herself on the deck of the Thames, surrounded by more handsome men from India and Scottish sailors in their kilts on their way back to Britain. Liz is not upset. She's happy to set sail on this pleasure boat. She hears bagpipes play the Scottish soldiers away in the humid Hong Kong day. I wave goodbye to my friends and the beautiful city with the keenest regret. The fifth stage of my journey has begun under the shadow of Union Jack. Fortunately, the Tim's mailboat is faster than the Prussian, which is great because from now on, the dial is being turned up on the race. Liz's long stops and daydreaming in cities is over. She is well rested for the second half of her journey and will have to muster the strength to see it through. As Liz sets sail for Singapore, the midpoint of her race, she will pass her competitor. A Race Around the World was written, produced, researched, narrated, scripted, edited, edited again, re-narrated, soundscaped, scored, mixed and mastered by me, Adrian Bain. Sam Dingman was our editorial consultant and emotional support. Father Time was played by Jake Dingman. Resources include 80 Days by Matthew Goodman, in Seven Stages, A Flying Trip Around the World by Elizabeth Bisland, and for more resources, go to our website, strangersabroadpodcast.com. Please go to Apple Podcasts to rate, review, and subscribe to A Race Around the World. If you leave a review, I will read it at the end of the credits, like... JBU crew member gives it five stars and says, Liz and Nellie are my heroes. Can't believe the story isn't better known, but so glad it's being told in this wonderful show. Thank you so much. And if you're interested in all of the bonus content, anecdotes, and historical facts that didn't get into the show, head over to our TikTok at Strangers Abroad Podcast. If you would like to email us, please send over a lovely message to strangersabroadpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening and come back next week for another leg in the adventure of Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland. Safe travels to everyone out there. <laughs>